Okay, I had that pie this morning. Bloody hell. Hi <sighs> there. The chest straps just broke. Sun's out and everything. We're not even digging, we're not even digging here. We're not even digging deep. That's just easy. There we have it, dog in our rucksack. So taking the dog camping, uh, I'd get to site and I had a routine. As soon as I got to site, I'd pitch the tent. If moss was there, if there's midges or anything, I'd try and cover her. If it was raining, I'd try and cover her whilst I got the tent pitched and then I'd get her in the tent, I'd get all my stuff in and the first thing I'd do is feed her, dry, well dry, get all her stuff off, dry her, feed her, take care of the dog first and then I'd unpack all my stuff, I'd get ready and then I'd you know, get all my stuff out, change my clothes, um, get, a, get, get into my sleeping bag and stuff. But part of that, uh, taking care of the dog first, was also a check so i'd check her paws and i'd check her over for ticks and i'd just check her over to make sure everything was all right there's no cuts or anything because dogs are a little you know they're little troopers they'll go on they'll keep they'll push themselves beyond their comfort zone just to please you it's just the, the this way we have of working with dogs and it's our responsibility to try and be mindful of that and keep our eye on it just to to try and pick up on anything because they, they, they won't tell you they can't tell you they'll try and keep going as long as they can and generally when they stop there it can be it can potentially be something more serious unless there might just be a dog that's not into it and it's like i'm not doing this and the, the male female dogs breed types they're all they all bring different characteristics but you'll you'll get to know your dog um and know what to expect one thing that I didn't do, when we were hiking, one thing that I didn't do ever on the trail is play like games with her, throwing sticks, balls, kicking things, you know, occasionally I would flick a little stick for her or ask her what she had and she would run off, but I certainly wasn't throwing sticks all day because when they're running, stopping, especially with the pack on and on mixed terrain, that's when you're going to get more injuries, so the reason why I didn't do that was basically injury prevention. Often when we met other hikers or people, they would coo over her and of course she would come up and lay a stick at her feet and want to play. Them not knowing any better would play with her and I think that may be one of the things that caused her to get injured on her sky trail. I can't say for sure, it could have been something else, she can't tell me exactly what it was but I suspect it's maybe a paw injury from skiting along on a gravel path when we met two French girls who were throwing a stick for her. So just be mindful of things like that. You have to be like really mindful at all times of what they're up to because it's a long time you're out for. It's long distances under different circumstances, heavy, you know, heavy packs up and down. Things can happen very easily to you and the dog. So yeah, you're you're checking all your kit. You're go, you've gone to the vet. You've got all your critter control stuff. You've got your tick collar, your sprays. And all this sort of stuff you've got you know what to do don't you as well don't put your hands down just if if the dog's going to be lying anywhere for any length of time try and put down your ground sheet and get them to lie on that i don't have a i don't most doesn't have a sleeping mat or a sleeping bag just now because she tends to lie on on me however if you get a, a therma rest do the, this like butt pad and it's just like a closed cell foam sleep it well this is just like to sit a sit mat but they also do this as a full size sleeping mat if i had a larger dog um and if we were going out in winter and most didn't sleep on us or anything i'd be tempted to get one of those they're not very expensive i'd be tempted to get one of those and cut it to a right side the right size for moss and that would be our sleeping pad to insulate her off the ground i also um, don't have a sleeping bag for her. She lies and because she lies on me, she doesn't need one. When we if when and if we go out in colder temperatures camping, I mean I'm talking anything below like five degrees Celsius. If we go out in that, I 
dog sleeping bags are mega expensive. I've looked them up online. I have a like cheap down jacket from Go Outdoors. It's like this Alpinist one. It's a brown thing. Moss has already been cold when we've done the West Highland Way in April. I just put her inside that. I was colder, of course, but I'm not having my dog being cold. So she went inside that jacket and she's sitting there with the wee hood up and all that. And that's basically a down sleeping bag. And it's more versatile because yeah, I can wear it as a jacket. She can lie on top of it. She can go in it, whatever. I would look at getting like that. That's maybe like £35, £30, £40. I can't remember. I'll look it up. I'll put a link below. Go outdoors. You can get it for so you've got the discount. And that does the job just as good. Depends on the size of your dog, right enough. But uh, yeah, dogs need, you know, just someone else to consider. Dogs need a good sleep like we do. If they don't, their performance will be impacted on. So you don't really, you want to make sure they, you, they get a good night's sleep. Leaving, leaving dog mess around, um, right, you might be in the wilderness and all that, but certainly in built up areas, Dog and cat feces is super dangerous to livestock, cows and sheep. Like one species affects the other, and I can't remember between the four which is which, but the dog or cat feces can cause like sheep to, if, if the feces is there and it's sort of broken down and they eat some of the grass that's contaminated, it can cause them to like self-abort and all the parasites that can be in the feces can like, cause havoc for the livestock as well you wouldn't think it you'd think the dog oh it's a, you're out in the middle of nowhere it's doing a job in some grass no big deal well it can be especially for built up areas where there's livestock plus if you're in a well populated route say the west Island way and there's a lot of dogs going o over there like the amount of dogs pooping there it, it can it's surprising how quickly the amount of contaminants can build up and it pollutes the water courses. Now, if you're drinking out of streams low down there and you've got heavy duty pollutants in it, it's not good. Carry dog bags and as much as you can, put them away. If you are not going to carry it out, say you're in a really remote section, bury it like you do with your own poo. Not the plastic bag, just bury the dog feces. Sometimes I make jobby kebab sticks so I just get a stick and like have a jobby kebab and I can dig a hole and bury that or, you know, do whatever. Just don't leave the plastic bags lying around. There's In the UK, for some reason, people bag this stuff but then leave them hanging on trees and all this and you end up with like a shit tree. It's quite bizarre. But um, yeah, just that's another thing. Just be mindful about your, your dog's poop especially in areas that are built up for kids running about and stuff like that. that I assume that no, none of you guys would do that, but it might surprise you about the livestock and the built up areas or even just being mindful of the contamination to our water courses that we all need to drink out of at the end of the day. We've received some questions in the comments section of YouTube on one of the videos. So thanks for that. Thanks for the interaction. I love that. I'm here to help. Um, any tips and or suggestions or things that you guys have as well leave comments on them it's really helpful and if you, any suggestions for other videos drop us a line let me know subscribe to the channel support the channel it's encouraging to do it, it, it it's 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 a it's a two-way street basically it's a community um that's what i enjoy about it i get loads out of watching youtube videos and the interaction there i'm an active participant i, I, I like to watch other people's videos even just like a, a camera or something a review of that it's just such a mega useful resource so yanni i hope i'm not murdering your name and pronouncing it all badly has asked us some questions she's thinking about coming over to scotland in the not too distant future with her dog also a collie to do some hiking some long distance hiking obviously i've been doing things like that with my dog Moss who's a collie so there's some value in this to her but there's we, we've never done a dog specific thing so hopefully this video is going to be helpful for you give you maybe some different ideas so I'm going to now do a bit of a question and answer thing and I'll answer the specific questions that were asked of us I would like to especially know how much gear you bring along for Moss we done the gear layout earlier, we done the gear review part, and it's the base weight's about one and a half kilograms. That's the stuff I tend to bring. 
anything else first aid based or anything like that, I use parts out of my yeah. I use parts out of my first aid kit. You see in tip. Harness or the the bag, the the actual rucksack that the that the dog has. I'm worried that it will limit freedom of movement and cause ch chafing when worn over a longer period of time. What is your experience? My experience is that I had one, a cheap one, and it ripped Moss's armpits to bits. Red raw they were. I felt so bad. I, I put like, you know, like a salve on, like a skin ointment on them, and it took a while to heal. And especially with weeping and going on all along here, it was terrible. I should have never scrimped. I already knew Roughwear was a quality brand. Because in the past I'd bought other things that weren't up to scratch and I'd went and bought rough wear stuff anyway. I just went out, got that rough wear harness backpack and it's been brilliant. She's not had any problems whatsoever with it. Of course, sizing's super important. Ideally, if you can go into the shop and trial them with your dog, that would be the best thing. Or if you use a good online retailer, you'll be able to get one, test it out in the house if it's not any good try a different model or a different size but I found that's I looked at my GPS the other day and since I got it I think we've walked like one and a half thousand miles now Moss has probably had there's probably about a thousand miles on that rucksack and it's not caused her any problems and it doesn't restrict her freedom of movement at all they get used to it and you don't want them bounding about too wildly anyway you want to do try and keep them kind of under control just for their longevity on the trail you don't want them wasting needless energy. So they should be walking near or close. They shouldn't be running about wild, getting sticks or anything like that. So the bag shouldn't be moving about too much. As for restriction of movement, when I upload the Cape Wrath Trail, look at the Falls of Glomach Day, or even just some of the sections of the Sky Trail. Moss is up and down all manner of rocks and everything. It doesn't stop her jumping or climbing or anything. So I don't actually feel that it hampers her movement at all. Uh, to be honest with you. How much weight do you allow her to carry? One and a half to three kilograms. That's 10 to 20% of her body weight. However, I would stick to 10 or 15%. But yeah, about 10 to 15% is a good, I've found for the dog. Your dog might be a pure pack horse. You just need to have a wee bit of experimentation. Do you use any particular dog food when backpacking? Yes, I use her normal food that I feed her, a high quality dry kibble. And we've done a wee section on that earlier. Of course, I'd read your questions before having done the video, so that actually guided the course of the video itself. Leash, are you in full control of your dog? Is it ever frowned upon not to have him or her on a leash? How do you go about having moss on or off the leash? So basically, I, it's not frowned upon to have your dog off the leash or on the leash unless you're in an area where there's livestock or built up with traffic or there's other people around, say a picnic area and you've got your dog jumping up in folk, that's not really that good. If there's other dogs around, your dog's jumping up on them. Depends on your dog though. If your dog's glued to your side all the time, then it's not a problem. However, what I would say the main one is if there's livestock about, whether there's a sign up or not, keep your dog on a leash. If you're, now some of the signs do say under on a leash or under close control. Some say on a leash and on a short leash. I would just put my dog on a leash. Whenever there's livestock, put your dog on a leash. For your own peace of mind, whenever there's a road, put your dog on a leash. For your peace of mind, whenever there's a dodgy bit, put your dog on a leash. You don't want to come around a corner on a narrow path and your dog's jumping up on folk and it's making them feel as if they're unstable. I guess it's just good etiquette. If you're in a sort of a tourist area on the Sky Trail around Old Man's store and bits like that, it's mobbed with people. Sometimes the track is narrow. Put your dog on a leash then because when someone's coming towards you, if they're unsure of dogs and you've got a dog, it's, you know, they can freak out about it. When they see that they're on a leash, it gives them peace of mind. One big restriction, especially in the West Highland Way, in April when it's in lambing season, not only keeping your dog on the leash when there's when it's lambing season, but not going anywhere near the livestock, because you don't. It's just too much of a risk. So if you look at my West Highland Way video, you see you'll see I actually had to take a detour because the Conic Hill bit 
has livestock on the hillside that you walk through and it's they don't they they don't allow you on it now in Scott in the UK if your dog's caught worrying sheep it's legal for a farmer to shoot your dog it doesn't happen but it has happened because farmers are kind of getting sick of the havoc that irresponsible people are caught dog owners are causing and the livestock so it might just be a town where it's like that in general though people in the UK love dogs it's not a problem just it's just being responsible I know it might be different in different countries for example I know in some countries if you're uh, in public with a dog you have to have a muzzle on uh, at all times that's not the case here so keep your dog in a leash and built up areas just be sensible how I go about having moss on or off the leash, it's on a carabiner, clipped to my shoulder strap, showed you how it went and I just clip it on it. When the rock satch cover on, there's the little webbing loop at the back and I just have it on it like there. Midges, do they bother our four-legged friends? Yes, they do, um, particularly in, in the ears. Where do I see you? So in Moss's ears in here, the, the where there's no hair the you know if i do that it's, it's all lumpy and red and sore the bitter sore there so i just squish some smidge and i just rub it rub it between my hands and then i just rub it on the inside her ears midges will go all over her but that's the only place that she can get bitten sore by midges um and they don't really bother she'll lie there covered in midges and like shake her head and snort and even though they're obviously a bit in her ears She's never really seemed that bothered by them. Do you allow your dog to drink from and swim in streams and lakes? Yeah, um, allow her to dry, uh, do both. Um, streams, lakes, she can drink from, she can swim in. Depends where it is. High, higher up ones are fine. You know, anywhere deep or anything like that, I don't, I'm not so keen on her going on, especially with the backpack. But actively encourage her to lie down in streams and rivers if you watch some of my videos you'll see us send her in to lie down and wet that cooling chest plate to keep her cool anytime i can if it's hot outside i'll get her to go and lie down in water as much as i can just to keep her keep her cooler basically and i actually actively encourage her to get a drink uh, she knows if i ask her if she wants a wee drink if she does she'll lick her lips if she doesn't she won't and generally like she can't do this camping but if her bowl's there she'll put her paw in the bowl if she's wanting something and i'll ask her if it's a drink or food that she wants she always wants food so generally i'll ask her if she wants a drink first if she licks her lips i'll know she wants a drink if she doesn't it's probably food she's wanting any other potential health hazards that you take measures to avoid just ticks mega vigilant with ticks because they are they pose the biggest threat to us with lyme's disease there's more ticks in Scotland and the UK than there ever has been before. Uh, the chemicals that you use and how often they dip sheep has changed. So the sheep used to act as like a mop of the hillside. The ticks would attach themselves to the sheep and then die. Whereas now that treatment's not as effective. So it's not having the same cleaning thing. The amount of deer in the countryside is also much higher. And because of lack of interest in a lot of different country pur pursuits, and estate management site stuff there's not as many estates and they're not managed to the extent that they used to be uh, so the the parasites and insects there's, there's basically just more nowadays and more are carrying Lyme disease so be super vigilant I treat all my clothes with that peripheral blah, 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 whatever I'll put a link to in down below is there's a company called Life Systems that do a spray but there'll be other generic ones in different countries it's just a the chemical name you're looking for and i treat moss's clothes she's got the tick, tick collar i always wear long trousers so i wear long trousers and i wear gaiters all the time i tuck everything in so there's there's the the chances for ticks getting on me with long everything everything tucked in and treated and being vigilant i don't you know i never just lie back and put my hand in the grass willy-nilly i'm always super mindful uh, being careful have you ever encountered any problems hiking with your dog in scotland no i haven't uh, everyone uh, it's the opposite people love seeing you going hiking with your dog in scotland especially with the rucksack they stop cars they take pictures 
they compliment on you oh, it's good to see if they're at restaurants they'll come up they'll pat your dog people are mega dog friendly here and it's quite novel seeing the dog with a backpack on so they love it so no i've never had any problems whatsoever hiking with my dog it's it, that is one of the really good things that i'm really pleased uh, that the the everywhere's so dog friendly where people are in general if you go for a shower on a campsite or go on other errands when it might be difficult to bring your dog do you just leave him in the tent or do you get a fellow camper to watch him for you me personally moss is good in the tent she'll just lie down and go to sleep um normally if i'm going to quickly nipping into a shop i'll tire to outside with the lead um and just quickly run in I never really leave her in the tent for any length of time. The the biggest, the longest she's ever in a tent herself is when she is um, waiting for me to get a shower. Some of the walks that I've done, they don't allow dogs into the restaurant, but they'll make you food up to take away. So tie the dog up, go in, order food, they'll come out with it. And they're often very apologetic and all that, wish you could come in sort of thing. But a lot of pubs that sell food, they have a little area around the corner. If your dog's cool, they'll allow you to go around there and have your dog in there. So uh, there are a lot of places that allow you to take your dog in as well. Most time I don't need to. I take her everywhere with me. Um, going into shops, you can't bring dogs into shops. Tie her up outside for a wee bit. And Moss is cool in the tent. She'll just lie down and go to sleep inside there. Have you ever had to bring your dog in buses or other public transport vehicles on your trips? If so, do you know of certain rules, restrictions with regard to that in Scotland? Yes, um, Moss, we have we get public transport everywhere. So f the last one, Cape Wrath Trail, we got a taxi into Glasgow. We got a train from Glasgow to Fort William. We got a boat from f across the water to the start of the Cape Wrath Trail. We walked up the, the, the end. We got a tourist bus from Cape Wrath down to the ferry uh, just outside Durness. And then we got the ferry over, I'm talking a small boat. And then I got a lift by some people in a camper van to the campsite. And then we got a small, it's like a transit, Ford Transit van, a small bus down to Lairg, where we then got a train uh, down to Glasgow, where we got a taxi back to my work where I got my car. Trains in Scotland, you can take dogs on. There's no problems taking dogs and trains in Scotland. On smaller buses, they're like tourist buses and stuff, often dogs are allowed, but see coach networks, so like you can either get the bus or the train to Fort William, say, you can take a dog on a train, not on the coach, they don't allow it. So any coach services don't allow you to take them, but smaller informal ones do. Often in remote, re remote places, like up north, they're a lot they're a lot more flexible because there's not as many people up there so they need to allow and and people go up there on holiday and often they take dogs so they're a lot more flexible there so generally where you'll be going to the outskirts they'll let you take your dog we um went on we were on i can't remember where it was now actually we were on one of the western isles and went on a bus tour a, and a boat tour I, uh, we went out to um, a holy island and the dog came on all of that. If you look on the Sky Trail, uh, for example though, but, uh, dogs are allowed on buses up in Sky. It's only coaches. So I'd say that. Local buses, tourist buses, trains, everywhere, dogs are allowed. Coach services in Scotland, dogs aren't allowed. So you, you can't get a bus from Glasgow or Edinburgh to Aberdeen, say, with a dog, but you can get a, a, a train. So you can get about everywhere with dogs. Getting public transport with dogs isn't an issue. It's just you have to um, just pick the right public transport. Pros and cons to bring your dog along. Are there any, apart from the occasional injury, of course? No, not really, not for me. Um, Moss is really good. If your dog runs away, if your dog pulls on the lead, 
if your dog gets tired too early, if your dog um, barks all the time or is aggressive with other dogs, if your dog's a bit of a pain in the butt at times, if you're eventually over a long time, it would be, that would wear pretty thin. But um, Moss isn't like that. We, she's great basically. She's, there's, so there's no, no problems at all. Sometimes I've had a fright where she's done something. Maybe she's been off the lead and I cut a four by fours came along and I've got a fright and, or maybe I've, I've reacted and she's not done something the way and sometimes I get worried about her but it's not there's no there's not really for me there's not any cons but for example I could say taking them on public transport but the main thing that made me get a train to Fort William and then the train back down from Inverness and use the bus thing is because parking your car anywhere is a, a nightmare anyway so if, to, for me to leave my car in Fort William, not only would it be more of a hassle to get back to Fort William from the north, but also they were looking to charge like £180 for me to say the long stay car park. It's just not worth it. So, no, I, I, getting about, I use public transport and I can always get about with a dog. Um, because Moss is a good dog and is kind of well suited and her breeding temperament is good for hiking, there's not any real cons. Uh, I don't see with taking my dog. It's all pros for me. Like she's a brilliant companion dog, and um, you know, I guess arguably, you know, I could say like I might not really like enjoy these things. I might not even be in inclined to go and do some of the walking and hiking that I do if it wasn't for Moss. She encourages me to get out with her. I just I love it. Um, and even though she's been injured, I've had to carry her. You know. She's a tax or whatever. It's just that none of that's a big deal. I would leave all my super expensive gear in the bushes if it meant that I could take moss out or something. She comes first, you know. I look after her first and foremost. And if someone happens to her, I make sure I'm prepared. And that's it. Because that I'm saying that just to try and give you an indicator of how much value I get out of taking my dog with me. When I was younger, I used to have a border terrier, a male border terrier. He didn't listen to commands, he would run away, he was a family dog, he was terrible behaviour, really stubborn, uh, he would pull on the lead and I used to go out and play in the woods when I was young and I, I, it was a real shame because I ended up not taking the dog with me because it was just too much of a worry, too much of a hassle, it ruined the experience. Moss enhances the experience. So yeah, it really does depend on your dog. But as for getting about or the equipment or hassle or anything, no, nah, it's brilliant. This is more Scotland specific stuff. Um, so it might not be as of as much interest to some of you guys that are watching this. I read a report that mentioned deer fences in the southernmost part of Sky. Is that or other obstacles like it something you have encountered elsewhere in Scotland? And if so, were you able to get moss around without having to take major detours? Yes, I've encountered them. And generally it's not a problem and you generally don't have to take major detours. Unless you are com going out completely off the beaten track. Sometimes, if, they're, if you're on a trail and you come across a deer fence, there'll be a fence, uh, there'll be a gate somewhere. I can't remember, some of my videos have got deer fences in them. And including newly built deer fences and they've all got gates in them barbed wire normal short fences for livestock you can get over just get your walking poles push down on the barbed wire at the top and step across um, or use your butt pad or a combination of them all or just look for a, one of the bigger fence posts where you can clamber over with moss having the rucksack on I can lift her over these things um, but generally there's gates access rights in Scotland you've got the right to roam uh, doesn't mean you can go like in folks gardens and all this and you can't it applies to on foot not with vehicle within reason you can go about most places with your dog and camp as long as you do it responsibly and because of that landowners and such they don't want you if they were to put up a big bit of deer fence and, and there's no gate they know people would like cut through it they would wreck it so they, they build it in. So there's I've never came across a bit with locked gates or 
fences with no things or don't come up here. Scotland's quite open and the landowners and such, the state owners are, you know, they gear up for it. So no, there's generally, you will come across deer fences and such and barbed wire fences, but there's normally gates everywhere. And if you're walking specific trail routes, there'll definitely be a gate there. I plan to wild camp pretty much all the way because it seems like many hostels and hotels want to accommodate dogs and if they do it's very expensive. Is that your experience as well and do you always camp with moss? Yeah I always camp with moss because it's my preferred thing. One thing to look into is Scottish bothies. They're just like little uh, shelters um, that you can stay in uh, for free. They're not locked. Um, so if you're interested in not staying in a tent, look at bothies and you can walk often you can walk from bothy to bothy and stay in them a lot of people do that that's their preferred thing i prefer staying in my tent i like my own wee space i like setting up my own way moss is there yeah hostels and hotels there are a lot of dog friendly hotels but they tend to be expensive or booked the highlands is a popular place but if you ask them if especially the place is on a next to a popular walking route like the west highland way all these hotels often have a, a bit of ground that you can camp at. So you can camp next to the hotel, go in, get food, sit outside or whatever. So they also kind of cater for it, even though you're maybe not allowed to stay actually in the hotel or hostel. 